So now that we've looked at the specifics of the sea urchin gastrulation, we're now going to look at a different model organism here, and that would be frog. This is going to now be the frog gastrulation, and this is going to be part one of that. So frog gastrulation one, and just like we did for sea urchin gastrulation, we'll begin by talking about some characteristic highlights, some things to take note and be on the lookout for when we actually talk about the sequence of events that a frog gastrulation process uh, occurs and has within it. So, what are the characteristic highlights to be on the lookout for? Well, right now we're looking at a frog. A frog is a lot more of a developed organism, a lot higher order organism than a sea urchin. And one of the reasons it is such a more higher order organism, I should say, is because they are vertebrates. Vertebrates are all going to be with three germ layers. It's a characteristic that they all share. So when you have three germ layers as a vertebrate, you have to understand one thing. These are going to each, each layer I should say, each layer contributes. Each layer contributes and produces a distinct set of structures. Contributes and dis and dis contributes and produces. I can't remember what I was gonna say. There it is. Contributes and produces distinct distinct. Distinct is just a different way of saying differentiated, specialized set of structures uh, in adult organism. So this is a long sort of drawn out way of simply saying that vertebrates with three germ layers are very much specialized. They're very much differentiated because of their overall developmental and evolutionary history and path. Uh, best way to understand this is to just look at a very nice summative figure, figure 47.9. This is going to show you the major derivatives, the major end results, in other words, the major derivatives of the three embryonic germ layers. So E, G, L for embryonic germ layers within vertebrates specifically. So we're looking at the embryonic germ layers within vertebrates. What do they turn into? What do they result in? Overall, we can just state about each of them. Each layer is going to be, each layer is going to be with a very specialized and very specific developmental path. As we'll see when we talk about the actual events of frog gastrulation. Each layer with very specialized um, developmental path. So that's a very specific developmental path for every layer. Um, a lot more specific, a lot more specialized than the sea urchin counterparts that we saw prior. So that's one sort of overarching characteristic highlight. Advanced. That's what I like to think of this section as. It's an advanced form. Another characteristic highlight of this gastrulation um, is the sort of consequence of being a vertebrate and being bilateral, therefore. Frogs and also we could say other bilateral organisms other organisms that undergo, uh, bi let's say, bilateral vertebrates specifically, are going to be with some very characteristic uh, uh, shapes, and not shapes, but regions within their body, I should say. And that would uh, mean simply like things like frogs have a dorsal region, so do we. Frogs have a ventral region, so do we. Uh, frogs have a very distinct and clearly recognizable right and left side. They have an anterior and therefore they also have a posterior. This is not a new thing that we're talking about here. When you get more developed, when you become a more advanced bilateral vertebrate, let's say, you have these things. You have a dorsal side, or that's known as the top side. You have a ventral side, that's the bottom side. You have a right and left side. Anterior would be just your front, and posterior would be your back end. Why is this? Why do you have these new sort of sides instead of, you know, being a sea urchin that's relatively, you know, simple and doesn't have this? Well, this is because these all are going to arise. They all are from development. They all are, are going to arise in development specifically during, you guessed it, during gastrulation. The reason why gastrulation is so critical, therefore, is that you end up with these super, super animal-like, uh, very characteristic things like being dorsal, having a dorsal and a ventral, right, left, you get it. So that's another characteristic I like to be on the lookout for. In addition, during frog gastrulation, we're also going to see that cells 
move, cells migrate to begin gastrulation. But there's going to be something uh, I want to be a little bit more specific about in terms of this event. So cells move to begin gastrulation, uh, but what we're going to be noticing and what we'll see when we see the actual sequence of events is that the movement specifically plus the gastrulation that results, that is a result of this cell migration and movement, it's all going to begin on, and there's a reason we mentioned all this stuff down here, it all begins on a specific side, a dorsal side um, of the blastula. Okay, so that's something to remember. Now we have a very specific area at which we're going to be focusing our sequence of events of gastrulation on in the next flowchart and video. And then also what we have to remember is that, remember the gray crescent from development one about frog embryos and that yolk that might have some sort of influence on cleavage? You know how we said that a gray crescent forms? Well, that gray crescent actually forms on the dorsal side as well. Okay, so a lot of dorsal to remember here on dorsal side. Overall sort of end-all be-all consequence of this, just remember that this gray crescent is going to form on the opposite side. Anytime you think dorsal side, this is the opposite side of where the sperm entered the egg. Opposite side of sperm entry to egg. So it's on the opposite side. That's the dorsal side. Where would this side be then? This would, of course, mean the opposite of dorsal would be ventral. Sperm entered ventrally, but if this gastrulation and great crescent formation is happening, dorsally. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Final characteristic highlight that we'll see and we have to remember is the idea of the blastopore still here and relevant here during frog gastrulation. The blastopore is, again, just the open end of the archenteron. Okay, it's the open end of the archenteron, and here this is going to be the structure that develops into, and if I told you that frogs are deuterostomes, this will develop into, not the mouth, but the anus. This is the first open end. Later on, as we'll see in the next sequence of events, how this structure, this open end of the archenteron, blastopore, eventually rounds itself out and also creates the second opening, the mouth, in the sequence of gastrulation. That's what we'll look at in the next two videos.